Hello, church. It's so great to be with you today. We have fully entered into our autumn season, and we have a lot to let you know about uh, that's coming up on the calendar for you to get involved with. First of all, just uh, so excited to be saying that we are bringing back Trunk or Treat once again. It's that time of year. It'll be on October 31st uh, from 6 o'clock till 7.30. We're going to have that whole parking lot out there just packed with trunks, free candy for the kids. Um, We're going to have a food truck for those who'd like to come for dinner, free coffee as well as specialty coffees available um, for purchase. So it's just going to be a really great night, and I hope you can make it out. So mark your calendars for that. If you're looking to volunteer for Trunk or Treat, we are opening the volunteer signups today. You can sign up to volunteer on our Facebook group. You can volunteer uh, at the link below this video. So get involved, host a trunk, bring your family. It's going to be a really good time. Uh, Also in October, on Thanksgiving Sunday, we are opening up the tank for water baptisms. Now, if you haven't been water baptized since you first believed, this is uh, something that we do following Jesus' own example as he was baptized in obedience to God's command and has asked us to do the same. So if you're waiting for some sort of moment... um, or the right time to be baptized, this is it. This is your opportunity. Talk to myself. Talk to any member of the church staff. We'd love to walk you through water baptism and how you can get baptized on Thanksgiving Sunday. Uh, For the ladies out there, just letting you know that we have a gene event coming up. It's going to be on Monday, October the 17th here at the church. The cost is $5, uh, but it's free for students and also free for new people. What an amazing opportunity these events are to just come together uh, with other women, to hear testimonies, some personal stories shared from the heart, as well as to uh, experience the joy of fall drinks. I know that those planning it have a lot of amazing uh, stuff ready to go on the menu. So mark your calendars, October 17th, Monday night at 7 o'clock, the Gene event is coming. Uh, furthermore, in October, we have a work day. I know that that's a lot less appealing than a gene event, but hey, our yard, it needs some work. Uh, it needs a little bit of sprucing up as we head into the winter season. So if you are willing to mow or weed or rake or sweep or anything like that and would like to come and give a little bit of your time, we're going to be doing that on October 15th, that's Saturday, October 15th, from 9 to noon. You'll be hearing more information about that on our Facebook group. But if that's something that interests you or some way that you're willing to volunteer, we'd love to have you out for that as well. And the last reminder uh, is just that our life groups are up and running again. We have 10 active life groups right now, which we're just so excited about. We're praising God for uh, this opportunity for people to get involved We have a variety of life groups when it comes to age, demographic, uh, location, and focus. Some of our life groups are sort of a more traditional Bible study. Some are more topical or are a book club. Uh, Some meet once a month, some every two weeks, some weekly. So find the speed that works for you, for your life. I just really encourage you, get involved in a life group. It is a great way to connect with fellow Christians and to be able to have those discussions and ask those questions that maybe aren't... um, going to be able to get answered on a Sunday morning when we're all together, but that's that venue where you can really work out your salvation and work out your faith with fellow Christians all uh, working together. Now, it is Mission Sunday today, and so our mission's focus for the month of September is the Kelly family in Estonia. They are our uh, Canadian Foursquare missionaries over there. Estonia is a country in the Baltic state, so it's right beside Latvia, Lithuania, uh, really close to Russia, uh, and the, that family has been there uh, for some time now, ministering, really advancing God's kingdom. They'll tell you more about it as they have filmed a video for us to know what they uh, are doing and how they're doing. And really, with all of our missionaries, we just we want to support them. We want to pray for them. We want to encourage them. And if possible, we want to uh, bless them financially as well. So I'll let the Kellys tell you what they're up to, and I'll be back in a moment to uh, let you know how you can get involved in supporting them. Hello, Sunshine Hills. This is John and Anneli Kelly. Uh, We're Foursquare Missionaries in Estonia, and we're happy to give you an update of what God has been doing here in Estonia recently. This is our fourth year in Estonia, and the summer has just ended. We had a very busy summer full of all kinds of activities. And now we're back to our daily schedules. We're back uh, to uh, doing the women's meetings and we have new women coming out. 
and John is going to start uh, with his uh, youth nights again on Wednesdays for for young uh, for young men. And yeah, uh, some of the women from the women's meetings uh, started a Sunday school program. So our kids go to there and they bring their friends there. So that's going really well too. Um, Estonia is located right next to Russia. So for the past uh, seven months, um, Estonia has been feeling the effects of everything that's been going on with Ukraine. There are many, many um, refugees here. We've been building relationships with the Ukrainian community here and helping uh, to find uh, things that they need. And we're obviously praying that, that peace will reign uh, here in the world. We're also involved in the Foursquare Up North region, which includes the Scandinavian and Baltic countries, as well as Poland. Um, Anneli last year was elected as, the, uh, as an elder, and I'm currently serving as the youth uh, coordinator for our shared region here, which gives us lots of opportunity to minister and serve John is going to be traveling to Athens this fall to uh, come together with the rest of the Foursquare uh, Europe youth leaders to plan the next Foursquare Youth Conference in Europe that's going to be happening uh, next uh, year in February in Greece. For the past two years, we've been working with young offenders here in the city, and um, we've been looking for ways that we can engage with them and share God's love, build connection relationship with them. Anneli uh, this year was accepted into a soul care program that would be recognized by government institutions. And so we're really excited to see how God is going to use that to open doors to work with the young offenders, as well as in hospitals and, and other types of uh, more formal settings. We want to thank you so much for your continued uh, connection, prayer and support. And if you are thinking of us, then you can pray that uh, there will be peace here, especially in Ukraine, and uh, that uh, kids will transition well um, in school, continue learning Estonian, which is a very difficult language, and pray that God will give us wisdom to be able to see the doors that he is opening uh, for us to uh, have an impact in Estonia. So as I mentioned, we just really want to pray for our missionaries. First and foremost, we believe in the power of prayer and in encouraging them that way. We also want to send them encouraging uh, messages. They are on Facebook. They can be connected uh, to through various Foursquare means. So if you want to get in touch with them, definitely let me know. Let church office staff know. We'd love to pass on a message of encouragement to them as it can be quite lonely when you're on mission. And then finally, if you're looking to give towards the work that they're doing there in uh, Estonia, you can, uh, on your envelope or in your um, e-transfer, you can just mark down September Missions or the Kellys, and we'll make sure that that money gets to where it needs to go. So let's pray for the Kellys together. Lord Jesus, thank you for John and Annalie and for their children. Thank you that you have called them to this amazing purpose and that they have answered that call. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would just be with them in all uh, aspects, Lord, in their ministry, in the, the schooling of the children, Lord, in the learning of the language and the culture, Lord, in reaching people with your good news. Would your spirit be with them and over them and upon them? Lord God, we pray for protection over them physically and also protection uh, of their minds as they are so close to Russia and in this volatile time. I can only imagine... Um, the anxiety that that can cause uh, for a nation like Estonia. So we just pray your protection over the Kellys and for the, the churches that they're involved in and the community that you've placed them in. Lord Jesus, would you give them peace? Would you give them blessing in your holy name? Amen. Well, without further ado, let's jump into God's word together. We're going to be looking at Philippians 3 this morning. I hope you're excited. Church starts now. Whenever we do a preaching series that goes through a book of the Bible, it's really easy to remember what happened the week before. This week we're doing Philippians 3. Last week we did Philippians 2 because that's how numbers work. Now, maybe you remember last week we talked about humility. We talked about unity. We talked about working out our salvation with fear and trembling and what that looks like, what that means. Uh, and this week we're going to really be continuing a lot of those themes 
forward as Paul is writing this entire thing uh, as one letter to the church. You know, often we read it broken up into chapters, but if you didn't know, uh, the chapters are not original. So originally, the Apostle Paul would have written this as one letter to that church, and the way that the church would have uh, received it actually would be that one of their leaders, maybe a pastor or preacher, would take that letter and read it live from the stage, the whole thing in its entirety, as if uh, sort of a, a video message, like what the, the Kellys had sent to us for the Missions Focus in September, Paul would send a video message through this letter of him preaching and encouraging this church. Now, as I mentioned last week, this uh, church wasn't in need of a whole lot of correction. Mostly it was encouragement, it was building. But there's also some warning in here because Paul knows that in the church of Philippi, as with all churches at that time, and I would argue all churches throughout all history, there are false teachers at work that have slipped into the church and are trying to lure people down the wrong path or distort the gospel of Christ. So Paul, he loves this church. He loves the Philippians. He wants what's best for them. He needs to let them know that there is this um, wrong teaching going on. And false teachers can come up for any number of reasons. I mean, you know, it's not like there's an army of false teachers in the church that get together on a a weekly meeting to decide how they're going to lead the people of God astray. There's all sorts of different things that can cause this. There are those who are false teachers deliberately who have come into the church to try and lead people astray for wealth, for personal gain and glory, maybe even for political uh, uh, strength. That's something that's been throughout all of church history and is certainly around today. But there's also false teachers who maybe they're doing it subconsciously. They're just bringing in some of the things that they um, had not submitted to the Lord Jesus, things from their previous beliefs, things from their previous life before knowing Christ. And they begin to twist or uh, change the doctrines that they're supposed to be upholding. This was common in the first uh, century, just as much as it's common now, uh, you'd have groups of pagans who would come in, people who had worshipped, you know, multiple gods, people who had been used to all sorts of practices that we would nowadays think are absolutely insane. And they would come into the church and they'd be saved, radically saved and in love with Jesus, but not quite sure how to blend this new teaching with what they used to know and how to reject uh, the culture that they came from. And this was also really strongly seen in the Jews, probably even more than the Gentile Christians, because those who were redeemed from a Gentile or pagan way of life coming to Christianity, that's a big shift. It's way easier, I think, to reject your old culture and embrace the new culture when the dividing line is so wide, going from worshiping many gods, some with the head of a goat and the legs of a crocodile or something, and now coming to Jesus. There's a big difference there. But for the Jewish Christians, a lot of them were really uh, struggling with how to balance all the things they used to believe, all the things that, all the philosophies that they would follow, and the law of the Old Testament with this new thing that Jesus had done, this new covenant, this new testament that they're now living in. And so they would, whether on purpose or accidentally, begin to add rules and regulations to the church to try and create. Uh, a sort of mixture of the new teachings of Jesus with the old teachings of the Old Testament. And this is what Paul is warning us about, because false teachers lead to false paths. And when it comes to walking out our spiritual journey, we need to make sure that we're on the correct path. Now, for those of you who might go hiking, maybe you'll relate to this, but on occasion I have been out on a hike or a walk, and I'll think to myself that I have seen or thought of Uh, a shortcut. I'm thinking, okay, getting from where I am to where I want to be, I could take the trail all the way around, but I'm pretty sure if I just cut right through here, I'll get there even faster. And of course, on that cutting through, I find out that there is a cliff or a river or a chasm or whatever, something impassable. And all of a sudden, the thing that was supposed to be a shortcut, not only did it not get me there quicker, it actually took longer overall because I had to backtrack. And so even though I perceived it as maybe getting me there, getting me to my goal faster, it actually was me walking away from my goal entirely. And that's what we're going to see with these false teachers, that the rules, the, the teachings that they're bringing into the Philippian church that Paul is warning against, 
may seem from an earthly perspective like good things, like movement in the right direction, but in fact are actually movement away from where God wants the Philippians to be. In a series that we're in, we've entitled A Worthy Life because of that statement that Paul makes in chapter 1 where he says to live a life worthy of the gospel. And hilariously enough, there is no quicker way to live a life that isn't worthy of the gospel than by trying to make ourselves worthy. Instead, we need to accept that Jesus has declared us worthy, and therefore we live in a way that flows out from that. But when we try to make ourselves worthy, we actually set ourselves up in opposition to the work that Jesus did. So let's read about this. Let's look at what Paul has to say. We're going to jump to Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. We're going to read a big chunk because I do like to hear uh, a good portion of Scripture at the same time so that we really get a sense for what Paul's saying. And I want you to notice uh, sort of what he's talking about when it comes to direction, when it comes to calling, when it comes to uh, walking out a path or a journey because he has a lot to say on that front. So Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, we're going to go until verse 20. Here's what Paul writes. He says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us, then, who are mature should take a view of such things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again through tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do eagerly await you. Lord, we want to spend every day looking towards your coming, looking towards that day when we will meet you face to face. Lord Jesus, would you reveal to us something of yourself in the passages of this uh, book of Philippians? Would you speak to us about your nature, your character, who you are, and what you desire for our lives? And Lord, if we have been the victims of false teaching, would you cast those things out and show us your truth and your holiness and your light? In your great name, amen. So, This first statement that Paul makes, he says, whatever were gains to me, I now count as loss. What a statement that is. You've probably heard it before. It's a very famous passage. And uh, on Sunday morning, we often sing the song, Lead Me to the Cross, which involves this idea of uh, not counting those things that once we counted as gains. But Paul, he, he's so forceful in his language here. Notice, he doesn't just say that the things he used to count as gains, he now 
counts as nothing or, or doesn't consider. He says, I consider them loss. They are a net negative to my walk with Christ. Those things that I once cherished and valued, I now recognize are actually a wrong path. They are walking away from the goal to which God has called me. So what are these gains? Well, Paul, in the verses before, he kind of starts to list some of the things he used to consider gains, and things like personal status, things like heritage, things like wealth and power, and there's so many things that this world would consider gains, the markers of success, the markers of victory from a worldly sense. But Paul is calling it out, and he's saying, those things, they don't matter. In fact, worse than not mattering, they can be a stumbling block and a false path that takes me away from where I need to go, which is towards Jesus. Jesus himself said, It's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Now, that's not because St. Peter is at the pearly gates checking everybody's bank statement. But the truth here and in that passage is that when we start to have these worldly gains in abundance, very quickly they can tempt us away from pursuing Jesus with all of our hearts. These things that the world considers worth pursuing are actually things that we need to reject. And this is a constant battle. This is a a constant trial for us who choose to follow Jesus, something we need to check up on ourselves all the time with. Am I being tempted away from the things of God by the lure of worldly gains? Am I giving up on things that God has called me to persevere and to push towards because I think that there's a shortcut or I think that there's another goal that I should be pushing towards? Put it this way, how many Christian parents care more about their child being financially successful than being spiritually successful? How many Christian workers would put in more time at work to make that extra money but won't put in more time in their devotions to meet Jesus in those pages. And I'm not meaning to condemn anyone. I'm just as guilty of these things. If I was up here claiming that I'd never followed this wrong path of worldly gain, I'd be lying to you. It happens to all of us. We will do it. And and you need to know that there's no condemnation in Jesus for those things. He's not there being like, oh, you know, you've ruined it. You've ruined your chance to meet me. He is so eager for us to be in relationship with him. But we need to constantly be vigilant and make sure that when we get tempted away that we take stock, we reject, and we turn our eyes back towards him who called us. Now, too often we find ourselves in the position of the fish who sees the bait on the hook and thinks that he's got a free meal only to get reeled in. The lure of earthly gains so often comes wrapped in spiritual language or in the guise of blessings. Now, it's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to get a promotion at work. It's not wrong to buy a better car than the one you already had. It's not wrong to get a better phone when yours breaks. I don't want you to think that. But when we start to pursue those things as our goal and we neglect pursuing Christ, then we have started to do injury to our own faith walk. So it's not the having of these things that's a problem. It is the pursuit of them and putting them in their improper place. Paul talks about the fact that he considers them loss for the sake of Christ, and he goes on to say that uh, he considers everything loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. Our relationship with Jesus is our most valuable asset. It is more valuable than our homes, than our cars, than our jobs, than our bank statements. It is everything that we need to pursue, everything that we need to uphold. Our relationship with Christ is first and foremost. He goes on to say that he considers those other things garbage. The word here is like refuse or even dung. Like he, he is, finds these things distasteful now. The more he pursues Christ, the more he realizes how much of a false trap these worldly gains can be. And he says that it's so that he may gain Christ 
and be found in him. I love this reflective language from Paul, that the believer is found in Jesus as Jesus is found in them. That there's this circularness to the relationship between us and Christ, that we gain him and he gains us. We're going to see a lot of that in this passage as well, this idea that Jesus and, and man, we have a relationship. It's not us begging him for his attention and him ignoring us. It is this mutual embrace between us and our Lord and Savior. The next statement that Paul makes, which is just so earth-shakingly revolutionary, but so often I think we gloss over these concepts, he says that he doesn't have a righteousness of his own, but that which is through faith in Christ. One of the core teachings of Christian doctrine is that we are not righteous. Yes, I have been saved through grace uh, and through faith in Jesus Christ, but I'm not not a sinner anymore. I still sin, and I will continue to sin. I'm supposed to work against that and and to try to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify me, of course, but I'm not going to be perfect in this lifetime. And yet, we know that Jesus is is perfect. He has perfect righteousness, and he has given us his righteousness. And the imagery is often that when we come before the judgment throne of God, he looks at us, and instead of seeing our unrighteousness, he sees Jesus's righteousness, and then we have entry into heaven. I like to think of it this way. It's like Jesus has gifted us a a coat, a beautiful, clean, pristine, brand new coat that goes over whatever we were wearing before. Now, my clothes are still underneath, tattered, dirty, maybe old, maybe missing a few stitches. But Jesus' coat of righteousness covers over those other things. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, does that mean if I have Jesus' righteousness and I don't have my own righteousness, does that mean I can just do whatever I want? Can I just sin and, and Jesus' righteousness covers it? And that is not what we should be taking away from this, and clearly not God's heart for us. You know, Jesus, he's given us this coat, and our own clothes are underneath, but having the clean coat is no excuse for having the dirty clothes under it. In fact, the gift of the clean coat should cause us to strive towards washing ourselves to match Now, we can never dirty Jesus' righteousness. It's perfect. We can never make him less righteous. But we should allow his righteousness to make us better, to make us more like him, closer to him in every way. Paul says that he wants to become like Jesus. And the word become like is a, a Greek word. It's a portmanteau of the word symmetry and the word shape. Literally, that we would look like Jesus, that when people uh, that maybe don't know him or even other Christians, when they look at us, that they would see the character and nature of Jesus, his love, his holiness, his mercy, his goodness, his faithfulness, all those things would be seen on us, that we would be Jesus to our communities, to our families, to our workplaces. Jesus died for your sins. And so when Paul says that he desires to become like Jesus in death, he's not talking about us dying for our sins. Jesus already did that. We don't die for our sins because he did that for us. But we do die to our past selves. We lay down all those things that we once considered gain, and we die to those things and are born anew into his kingdom. That's what baptism is. When we uh, do baptism, the reason that we go down under the water and come back up is it symbolizes dying to who we were before and rising again with Jesus to begin that process of looking like him and becoming more and more like him. Now, Paul has an amazing confession in verse uh, 12. He says, not that I have already obtained this. He's honest. He's open. He's like, I'm not there yet. And this is Paul. 
Here we are 30 years after his conversion on the Damascus Road. He's writing this and he's like, I still, I haven't made this. Like, I, I'm not there yet. And Paul is an apostle. He is the missionary, like the missionary in the world at that time. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. And even he's saying, yeah, I'm not there yet. I'm on my journey still too. And so if Paul is on his journey, we should be encouraged that we're allowed to be on our journey. And this is in direct contrast with the opponents, the false teachers that Paul is trying to combat, trying to come out against. Because one of the marks of false teachers often, not always, but often, is they claim to have already made it. They come from a place of saying, yeah, yeah, I've, I've made it. I've got this under control, and now I get to teach you because I know. But Paul, he's saying, no, 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 I get to teach you because I'm not there, because I'm walking with you. And we should all take note of that, that in today's um, day and age, we have access to more Christian leaders and teachers than ever before. Because of the internet, I mean, you could finish watching this video with me and go on to watch like 30 other preachers from different churches and you wouldn't have even scrapped the surface, scratched the surface of what's available out there. But we have to be discerning when we're listening to, to teachers, especially spiritual teachers. And anyone who claims that they have made it that they have attained the goal, that they have, you know, conquered these things, that's a red flag because it's a lifelong journey. It's something that we will be working on from now until the day we meet Jesus in heaven, whether it's by rapture or by death. We will continue to work on these things, to be sanctified by the Holy Spirit, to look more and more like Christ. Now, on the one hand, you might despair a bit at that and go like, this is something I'm going to have to do forever, like all of my life. That's so long. But we can also look at this as a blessing. What other assignment are you given in life where the deadline is never? <laughs> it's pretty good that we get to just keep working on this. We get to keep following Jesus because although we talk about a goal, really it's about the journey. You know, a tree doesn't grow so that it hits a certain height and then it's like, okay, I'm done. I'm never growing again. It grows just for the sake of growth. And that's what we're supposed to do as well. We're supposed to grow with Jesus, not because we're trying to reach an end goal, but because growing with him is the goal. Becoming more like him is the process by which we get to know him. And we find the Father and the Holy Spirit revealed in that process. So we need to do this work throughout our whole life to continue to follow after Jesus, to continue to find ourselves in his image over and over and over again. Not thinking that, hey, you know, I've, I've made it. This was a weekend course. I'm now like Jesus and uh, I can go off and pursue other things. Or maybe like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really become like Jesus. I should be done by the time I'm 40. And then after that, I'm going to, you know, do my own thing. This is meant to be uh, a practice that when we truly embrace it, it keeps us on track for our whole lives. Now, this next statement that Paul makes, he says, I press on, again, that very directional language, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. I love the reflective language again, as before, that Paul is saying, I'm pressing on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Jesus has taken hold of you so that you can take hold of him. And the order here is important. He reached down towards us first. He has reached out of heaven to grab you, to pull you up, to hug you, to embrace you and bring you close to him. And what he desires is for you to return that embrace. Don't be like that guy that when Jesus hugs you, you just stand there like this. Jesus is asking us to just join in to an embrace with him. That as, we take, as he takes hold of us, we take hold of him in return. But there's also a lesson here about earthly things. Because so often we find the truth that what we grab, what we take hold of, often takes hold of us. It turns out, a lot of things in this world, when we grab them, they grab back. And if we're not careful, if we're reaching after and striving after and grabbing towards the wrong things, we will get pulled. 
our possessions can very quickly possess us if we don't keep an eye on where our heart is, where our goal is, and what we're reaching towards. We find that there's almost a level of uh, a greed or um, desire in pursuing these worldly things. But those worldly gains that Paul says he now considers losses, those worldly gains will not satisfy us. They aren't Jesus. They aren't our creator. They aren't uh, even worth anything on a cosmic scale. And so although we pursue them, they will never satisfy our souls in the same way that Jesus does. And therefore, as we reach for them, we find them fleeting like water in our hands. And so we reach further and further. And soon we find ourselves far down a path that we thought was the right direction and realize that, wow, do I ever have to backtrack now? to get back on the path that Jesus wants me on. The Bible says that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. What we treasure, what we value, our heart goes to that place. And so if we're not careful, if we value material wealth, a newer car, a better house, if we value our position in our job, our uh, reputation in our community too highly, our heart will go into that place instead of being where it should be, which is with Jesus. Jesus is the only goal. He is the one that we walk towards. He is the one that we should desire and the one that we should be reaching towards. Him and his work on the cross. We often sing that song, the cross before me, the world behind me. That's the goal here that we would continue to walk towards that cross and that Jesus would be our horizon. He would be the one on whom we set our eyes and our hearts and our minds. Paul goes on to say, he says, all of us then who are mature should take a view of such things. And this is kind of a double encouragement or sort of a double tool because on the one hand, It's something to aspire towards, but on the other hand, it's also a litmus test. It's a bit of a a flag for maturity. When we're looking at Christian leaders, when we're looking at people who set themselves up to teach us, to guide us, we should be looking for this marker that they have this view that pursuing Jesus is what matters. Paul is saying, hey, if if you've got someone that's claiming to be a mature Christian, but they're teaching that you should pursue something else other than Jesus, or they're teaching that, you know, material wealth is what matters, or they're teaching that success is what matters, that's a red flag. They They aren't mature spiritually. The mature spiritual person knows that pursuing Jesus is everything that matters. And as I said, it works also as a goal for us to attain that if we desire to be mature Christians ourselves, we need to start changing our paradigm, changing the way we look at the world so that we are rejecting those earthly gains. And like Paul, we start to consider them losses for the sake of knowing Christ better. That's our, our marching orders. That's what we're supposed to walk towards. Paul talks a lot about following his example here. He says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Now, Paul is not telling us that we have to be exactly like him. He's not trying to make little Pauls. Paul's a sinful person. He's a human, just like you and me. He's prone to temptation and sin. He's not perfect. And so he's not saying that we have to be just like him. He's saying that as he is pursuing Jesus, we should look to that as a model, that we should also pursue Jesus. And although we may not walk the exact path he walked, we're all walking in the same direction. And he gives us this model. He says, keep your eyes on those who live as we do, that in our churches, in our communities, there will be Christian brothers and sisters who are more mature than us, who are further along in this journey than we are. And we are supposed to follow along like they are walking, using them as a model for how we pursue Jesus. Jesus is the goal. He is the direction that we're supposed to be walking. But don't worry, there's really good news. Because although we're um, all pursuing Jesus together, it's the direction that matters, not the speed. The speed of your journey is yours. It's yours alone. The Holy Spirit is not impatient. He is there to work with you no matter where you are, to walk with you no matter where you are. 
And so although we are called to look to other believers for encouragement on how to follow Jesus, we shouldn't look to them for comparison. Because our journey after Christ is our own journey. And what matters is that our feet are pointed towards him, that our eyes are set on him, not how fast we run towards him. Now we go into this next section and Paul talks about enemies of the cross. Very interesting section, very interesting language here. First of all, I just want to call out that he says enemies of the cross. These aren't our enemies. They're not enemies of us. People are not our enemy. We've said that here countless times, but I'll make sure to say it again. People are not our enemy. People are our calling. They're the ones we're supposed to be sharing the gospel with and talking to. But what Paul's talking about here is enemies of the cross, people who have set themselves up as antagonists or opposition to the work that Jesus did on the cross for them. In another passage, it talks about how Jesus was already crucified on the cross, and yet there are those who would crucify themselves, trying to earn their way into heaven, trying to do the work of making themselves worthy, making themselves righteous. Paul has some things to say about them. First, he tells us to watch out for them, because although we should pity them, as Paul does, he says he writes about this through tears because he cares for these people. Even though they've set themselves up as enemies of the cross, he cares for them. He wants them to actually become friends of the cross, to be in Jesus' family. But we're supposed to watch out for them that we don't accidentally follow their path, especially if they've set themselves up to be teachers in the church. And there's some markers that we're to look for. First, he says, their God is their stomach. Now, what this means is it's using the stomach as a metaphor for many things. The same way that we often do with body parts, we talk about the heart, right? Well, I mean, when we say that, you know, where our heart is, we're not talking about the physical heart. We're using it as a metaphor to mean our love, our um, desire, all of those things. And so the stomach here is being used as a metaphor for appetite, for desire after worldly things, for fleshly um, things that we want, sort of the greed and envy and all those things. And so when Paul says that their God is their stomach, what he means is that these are people who are ruled by their earthly desires, their appetite for power, wealth, success, maybe even food is what rules them. It's what drives their decision-making and their behavior. And so, again, we need to, when we're judging teachers in the church, we need to not just look at what they say, but how they act. Is their God their stomach? Are they being driven by a love and a pursuit of Jesus or by a love and a pursuit of the world? He then goes on to say that their glory is in their shame. Basically, he's saying they take a lot of pride in things that actually are not of God's kingdom, that they, if they knew better, would actually be ashamed of, things that Jesus has called us away from. Maybe they're really proud of how much wealth they've accumulated, and they're ignoring the fact that they've been called to be generous. Maybe they're really proud of how high they climbed in their workplace, but they're ignoring what they did to get there that was not of God. Their glory is in their shame. And finally, he says that their minds are set on earthly things. This is in contrast to a lot of what we talked about last week, the mind set on Christ. That instead of having their mind be set on spiritual things, on heaven, on that which is above, their mind is set on earthly things. Their desires, their passions are towards earthly things. The home of their brain, of their mind, is here on this earth instead of being in heaven where it should be. There are lots of false teachers out there. As I mentioned, there's never been a time in human history when we have access to more people who set themselves up as spiritual teachers. I mean, I'm here teaching you on this camera, and you should be judging what I have to say. If you're just sitting here taking what I have to say at face value, that's not healthy. And I mean, I'm trying my best, so hopefully I'm not leading anyone astray. But my point is that we should all be doing the work to look at those who would be teaching us and make sure that what they're teaching is in line with the Word of God. No one, not even Paul at the time, was saying that they're immune to this. He often would say, look at, look at what I'm doing. 
You want to know that my teaching is good. Look at how I live my life, that it's in line with what I say is good, that it's in line with what Jesus taught. And so as you go maybe to conferences, to churches, to uh, online uh, expressions of the church, make sure to put your critical thinking hat on to look at what they're saying and make sure that they're teaching us to walk down the correct path, the path that leads to Jesus. Because we, as it says in verse 20, are citizens of heaven. This is sort of the wrap-up verse for this section. Paul says, we are citizens of heaven who eagerly await a Savior from there. Now, in chapter 1, uh, Pastor Danny Jones preached on this, that as citizens of heaven, we are called to so much more. We are called to uh, have our eyes set on him who is the king and the Lord of heaven. That as citizens of heaven, this earth is not our home, and so it's not where we should be focusing our mind, that the things of this earth are passing, and we shouldn't be pursuing them at the expense of pursuing Jesus. If we want to live a life worthy of the gospel, we should take note of the encouragement that Paul gives us in these pages. We should be people who reject earthly gain in favor of gaining Christ and knowing him more. We should be people who press on through the highs, through the lows, pressing on towards Jesus, towards his cross and the work that he did there. And we should follow the example of those who follow Christ. Now, as part of today's service in person, we're going to be singing uh, the song Christ is Enough. I've put the link in the description below. My encouragement to you right now, or maybe later if you would like to do it more privately or personally, just give that song a listen. Maybe worship along with it. But what I really would love is if we can just spend time declaring those things that it talks about, speaking them over us, that we we pursue Christ above all else, that we have the cross before us and the world behind us, and that we will not turn back. So I encourage you to do that, whether it's in your personal time or right now or maybe with a group of people, but let's do that together. Let's really speak those truths over us and put into practice what Paul talks about in Philippians 3. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness. We thank you for the work that you did on that cross, dying for our sins so that we wouldn't have to. Lord, we thank you for your righteousness, that you clothe us in your righteousness, that we are not responsible to earn our way into heaven. But Lord, in response, instead, we choose to pursue righteousness in our own life, to follow after you, to become more like you. And Lord, would your Holy Spirit support us in that endeavor? Lord, would you just continue to guide us, to prompt us, to push us forward? Lord, for those who have followed the path of temptation, followed the false path that leads away from you, God, I pray a return to the correct path. Would you turn our feet towards you, that we may walk uh, in your direction, learning you, knowing you, and becoming like you? We ask this and we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, but you would like to, he died for you. He died so that you can have access to God the Father, to heaven, to an eternity of joy with him. And all you have to do is say yes. That's all you have to do. All the other stuff just comes with that package, like the righteousness and all of that. It'll come as you learn him, but the, the joy of salvation can be found just in saying yes to Jesus. If you would like to accept Jesus as your personal Savior, just say yes to him today. And declare that he is your Lord and your Savior and accept what he did for you on the cross. And if you did that, or if you would like to pray with someone, please ask a Christian brother or sister, or call the church office. You can also message me. I'm always happy to hear from you, because we'd love to celebrate with you, to pray with you, and to let you know uh, just how much Jesus loves you. Thank you all for being with me today, and looking forward to next week as Pastor Danny Jones will be back to wrap up our uh, book of Philippians, which we're calling A Worthy Life, Volume 1. 
Uh, and yeah, I really look forward to that. I hope you do too. Have a great rest of your week.